In today's video, I'm gonna show you how I have my sound cart set up. Cue the royalty-free dubstep and stutter cuts. Sorry. Anyway, this is my sound cart mini cart. So sound cart is the name of the company. Genius branding in my opinion. Uh, they're based out of the UK. The guy who runs the company is Matthew Bacon. He is a sound mixer who I believe just started making his own carts and it just caught on on the forums and the message boards. People saw them and he grew it into a company and now his carts are available in most of the location sound dealers. I got mine at Gotham Sound in New York City. Um, if you go to soundcart.tv, that's his official website and I'm sure there's info there to point you at the, the dealer closest to you if you wanna order one for yourself. So the mini cart starts at about 1150 USD and then you can add all kinds of accessories onto it which will bring the price up probably closer to 1500 to 2000 bucks maybe. It's super strong but it also is fairly light and you can get into some really tiny places with this cart and that's what I liked about it. Sound cart offer a ton of accessories for their carts. Um, they have an antenna mast, they have boom pole holders, they have cup holders, you can add the casters, you can add sliding shelves, you can add folding shelves, tablet holders, script holders, cable hangers. The sky's kind of the limit with these carts, which is really nice because they're super customizable. The stock version of this cart without any accessories on it weighs about 28 pounds and it can hold up to 44 pounds. I definitely have more than 44 pounds of weight happening on this cart overall and uh, uh, because I'm putting a rack case of equipment on here, this is pretty heavy. Um, Matthew from Soundcart suggested that we do some sort of brace on the shelf so we put in these triangle braces down here. I decided to add the casters to my mini cart which give it just more flexibility as far as maneuvering. You can basically spin the cart in, in place and uh, before if you had the, the stock feet that come with the stock mini cart, you'd have to actually tip it back to turn direction or anything like that. The other accessories I have on my cart are the antenna mast. I actually have a boom pole holder on both sides so I can do two poles. Um, I have a cup holder on the back. I have a cable hanger on the back. I had a headphone hook but I moved it recently. That's part of the fun of sound cart building is that you're always sort of tetrising new ideas and being like, what if I put this here and what if I put this here? So it's like a never ending sort of rabbit hole of <laughs> uh, potential, I guess you could call it. There's a million ways to set up a sound cart. I have mine set up this way because I work mostly in corporate, commercial, ENG, documentary, um, and so I don't need like a fully always built narrative cart, which this is right now. It's totally ready to go, but a lot of days I don't even need anything that's happening right here. I don't need the, all the faders, I don't need the screens, any of that stuff. So that's why I decided to put sort of like the, the second level of things you'd want on a cart in a rack so I can take it on and off pretty easily. The bag, however, is sort of the mainstay. I can use that whether I'm wearing it or I'm you know sitting down at this cart and I just put it right on the shelf instead of this rack. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some of the different parts of this cart. Up top, we have the bag. In the middle, we have the rack, and at the bottom, we have a case. It's a Pelican case. It's a 1557, which I think is the perfect case for a mini cart because it fits just perfectly between the, the wheelbase. It's a lightweight case. It's part of their uh, Pelican Airlines, so it is probably not something you'd want to have you know, thrown into the back of a plane. Um, but as far as living on a cart, it's cool. Only downside, it doesn't have any wheels on it but if you're putting on a cart that has wheels, like I am, I think it's a pretty good fit. So let's talk about what I have here in my rack. Uh, I'd say the most important part of this equation is the uh, fader control here. This gives you a uh, nice long fader control over essentially your mixer. Instead of using the knobs, you get to feel like you're sitting at a mixer, which is nice. It's got some other cool controls, especially the shortcut buttons here. Um, instead of having to dial through all the menus to do whatever you want to do, you can just get to the point right here. Next thing here in the rack in the middle is the uh, monitor. Some guys have their monitor up high and they have their mixer down hovering right over the, the CL12. Um, but I like to keep my eyes near the faders and the screen, so that's why I have these close together. And up top here we have the remote audio Speakeasy R1. This is, you know, it's just a few little speakers in here. It's got a volume knob, it's got a headphone jack, 
Um, it's got two inputs left and right, so you can listen to either or, both, or sum them together as mono. Um, it's nice to have this if you're on set and you just want to take your headphones off for a little while but still be able to listen to what's going on set. All right, let's talk about the custom rack. I've been getting a lot of questions on social media about this. So this rack is actually a custom made rack. I had them design it specifically for this configuration of what I'm doing here. What's custom about it is it is not an even amount of spaces from top to bottom height wise. Uh, this is a one unit, this is a three unit, and down here the sliding shelf is a one unit, but if you look in here this gap, this is two inches of space, which is like a quarter of an inch more than your standard one unit rack. I think a one unit rack equals 1.75 inches of space. This gap I left here so that the CL12 could pass through without banging into anything here. If you just had two spaces here, that would not be enough for this. And I even have my wood sides on the sound devices. I hate to say it. I shaved them so that they would be flush with the bottom of the chassis. Um, it's really kind of hurt to do because it's beautiful wood, but you don't see it in this configuration. It's at the bottom, but they are shaved off. I removed the feet from the CL12 to get it as low as possible. And even then, I still needed just a hair of space to get it to, to pass through. The other thing that makes this pretty custom is the depth. I'll include a link below for the sliding shelf. This was really hard to find, but this is about the most shallow sliding shelf I could possibly find, which dictated how shallow the, the rack could even be. So the rack's about 12 inches from front to back. The shelf is about 14 front to back. So when it's fully tucked in and taken off the cart, it'll stick out by one inch on the front and one inch on the back, but that fits within the doors. So once the doors are on, it's still able to close up nice and tight. The other reason I asked them to leave this space here was I knew I was gonna utilize it on this side here. I have the CL12 sort of scooted over to the, as far to the, to the left as it can go because then it leaves me enough space here to put in this Audio Root BDS. Um, this is a really simple one. It doesn't do any sort of e-smart uh, information like the one up here does in the bag. But what this is doing is it's telling me what the cart battery has for voltage and I can turn it on and off here. Um, but it's just nice to have it right on the face of the unit so you know what's going on. There's one other small customization about this rack, which is, you can't really see it, but down here below this one unit rack, uh, sliding shelf rack, there's a little space I asked them to leave. So they left me about a quarter inch of space because I knew I was gonna have to find some way to put mounting to the bottom of the rack to get it to go onto the shelf. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So you're looking at the bottom of the rack here. These are NATO rails which are made for cameras. I think you can mount all sort of camera accessories onto these. These two rails are accepted by a couple clamps that are mounted right to the shelf of the cart. Over here, you can just tighten these guys on the side once it's in and it stays in place. And if you wanna get it back out, you just loosen them out and it slides right back out. Let's talk about how I have this rack interfacing with the bag. So I wanted the ability to break the bag off and also have interruptible power between both sides of this system, the rack and the bag. That took some custom wiring, which I've done myself, to keep it as simple as possible as far as plug and play. I've utilized some Neutrik 10-pin connectors. And I'll show you here on the back of the rack, there's a patch base setup. Our first patch point is for power only. The next two are the Neutrik 10-pins, and across those 20 pins collectively, they're sending signals to and from the bag to the rack. The other thing, that's nice about this setup is if you're working in narrative and you're sitting down for most of it, and then you know you have a scene coming up where you can't take the cart with you to wherever you're shooting, maybe it's on a rooftop, maybe it's out in the woods, that's when it would be nice to be able to break this bag off of this cart without having to unplug a zillion things and, and worrying about if your power source is gonna follow you along and how to power the bag and all that. So what I'm doing here is, take a look in here, there is a PSC, Pelican Life battery. This battery can power this entire rig for about four and a half hours. What's cool about this battery is while it's plugged into AC power, so if you're on set and you can get some AC power, it's charging the battery the whole time. So in order to get redundant power, what I'm doing is I'm feeding my cart battery into the SL6 uh, Hiroshi 4, and that's set to the, be the primary source, which means that by default, the MP1 would be the secondary source. If I kill the power down here on my cart, 
switching power source to SL6 MP1. I have not interrupted that take and it just jumped over the other power source. The thing is, if you don't use MP1s and you're using eSmarts like I am, the workaround for this, it's a little invasive, but I did it and I think it works great because it gives you away and I'm just throwing some ideas out at you on how to get a second input. And all I really did was I just very neatly went in, found the two contact points on the battery terminals or where the battery you know, would line up into the slot and hardwired those into a DC jack, which you see here on the top of the SL6. So then I made a cable from, to go from the output of um, this BDS, which is using an eSmart battery, to plug into the SL6. And because I'm keeping an eSmart battery with the bag at all times, that's acting as a backup battery source. Yes, I would lose the screens and I would lose the CL12 faders, um, but as you can see here, it didn't stop rolling on the take. It was a, a seamless transition. And that's the most important thing to me. A couple other things I wanna mention, the way I have this bag set up is very similar to how I have my small ENG bag set up. So if you're interested in how I have this bag configured, um, I already made a video, it was like my last video, but it's pretty much configured the same way. I like to have them almost identical. So when I'm bouncing between them, one day small, one day large, uh, everything's in the same place, same kind of wiring, everything. So uh, check that out if you're interested or if, you, or if you do have questions about this, anything here, just leave them in the comments and I'll answer them for you. The other thing I think worth going through on this because I feel like we're gonna get questions is my antenna setup. Up top, I have these two shark fins. They're called uh, Sharkies. They're made by a company called Betso. Um, I really like Betso's company. They make really solid gear. I use their time code boxes, the TCX2s as well and uh, they're great. So these are powered fins. You can add more gain than you ever would, um, or you can pat them down. This antenna here is a SNA 600A dipole antenna. These fold down, they fold up. You want them upright and you want them vertical. These are commonly used for uh, transmission with like boom operator or you, your utility. So you'll often see these on sound carts. And uh, I'm just sending an output from my mixer that you know, takes the boom operator's uh, microphone plus my voice if I want to talk to him on the talkback, and I'm transmitting off like an SMQV, and that's plugged uh, via SMA cable directly into the BNC of this antenna. And it just gives you more range than you would get with using whips. And on this side here, we have the Comtech Mini Mic. That's a half wave antenna. It's a pretty long one, so I have it pointed down right now. If you're outdoors, you could probably uh, send it up but that is transmitting essentially your video village mix. That in this equation is coming off of a Comtech BST75216, which is like their base station uh, transmitter. Okay, uh, if you're still watching right now, congratulations. You're super into sound carts, just like I am. Um, this has been a pretty deep dive. I hope uh, you maybe got some ideas out of it at the very least, and um, yeah, if you have any questions, hit me up in the comments section. If you liked it, hit like. If you liked it a whole lot, you can hit subscribe. Um, the last video I did got a ton of new subscribers, so if you're one of the new subscribers, thanks for checking it out and thanks for doing that. And uh, I'm gonna just keep making videos because uh, I like sound stuff a lot. <laughs> uh, all right, later.